Indeed, every time you work in mathematics, you should hear Tadashi's voice in your head saying, ah, it might be better to draw a picture for this. So I shall. Here is the picture of the space of all n by n matrices. I told you that our pictures will not be physical representations of physical objects. That's the picture, big space. And inside this space, there might be many, many different elements. So for example, here, you may not see it because it's very small, is the identity matrix. Here is another matrix, here is another matrix, and so on. But the point is that the majority of this space, most of this space, yeah, is filled by invertible matrices. Yeah. And the bit that is not invertible, there might be some bits, is a very thin set. So this is the very thin subset of non-invertibles. If you are somewhere here, then if you move slightly in the vicinity nearby, you stay invertible. But if you're somewhere here, just sitting here, if you move a little, you fall off this very thin set. Yes? How do you know about this? Oh, because of, ah, maybe I should have explained. Because of that discussion we had about the zero determinant. Because a function being zero is a very, very unstable condition. You see, if you have a matrix whose determinant is zero, and if you change the entries of the matrix a little bit, which means I sort of kick it in various directions slightly, well, your main determinant is going to stop being zero, will become non-zero. Right? the matrix, you mean changing the elements of the Yeah, of course, that's what you mean. That's what you would mean, right? That's what I mean also, of course. So yeah, so you want every matrix invertible. If you keep changing it, you can get a... Uh, no, but if you change a lot, but if you change slightly, then if it's invertible to begin with, a slight deformation, slight perturbation will remain invertible. That's why I say small perturbation. And if you have a non-invertible case, if the determinant is zero, then even a very, very slight perturbation, there is always a slight perturbation. If you say, oh, I want a perturbation less than 0 0.00001, I can always do that and then make the determinant non-zero also. In that, case, in that sense, this determinant zero set, or the non-invertibles, form a very thin set. And the rest, the majority, is formed by invertibles. Is that clear? Yeah? This is a quite important point. Thank you very much for raising the question. If you want this most of the space, if you learn that kind of language, you can say that this is the open dense subset. Or, in terms of probability, it's also probability 1. It happens with probability 1, whereas the rest happens with probability 0. OK, so this is the situation. Now, we have already proved that this statement holds. That star, in other words, PQ and QT have the same eigenvalues. in this generic situation. So for most of the matrices, it's true. So almost all the time, this statement is true. Almost all the time, PQ and QP have the same eigenvalues because this argument applies. OK? Now, some of the time, but you'd better be really unlucky. I mean, this is almost never going to happen. It happens with probability zero, OK? But it might happen that you are on a non-invertible to begin with. Q might be non-invertible. In that case, what do we do? 
yeah, to prove p uh, star in the degenerate case, degenerate situation, really unlucky situation. So it's this situation. Okay. Let's choose. So let's suppose that q is somewhere here, really unfortunate. Okay. Choose Q1, sorry, invertible ones. Let's deform the problem. Q1, Q2, and so on, all of the invertible. What I mean is, I can approximate this unfortunate, unlucky, and degenerate Q by a sequence of matrices that converges to this Q, but all of which approximations are invertible. Okay? Q1, Q2, and so forth. Here is an example. This matrix is, of course, not invertible, but I can approximate this by invertible matrices. For example, 1 over n. For each n, it's invertible. And when I take 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, it's an approximation, and in the limit, you converge to this matrix. Okay? So, that's what you do. That converges, in that word, that converge to Q. But, Let's now revise Am I doing the right thing? Yeah, I'm going to leave this for a while. Ah, okay, I'm erasing the board in the wrong way because I was expecting to have two blackboards there, you see, so I'm a little confused. I'm sorry about this. I'm going to leave this and then work on that. Okay, why don't I move there? I'm sorry. I'm going to get better at this. But look at that statement, star, that PQ and QP have the same eigenvalue. Well, that statement, the claim, depends continuously on Q. What I mean is, if you have two matrices, A and B, they have the same eigenvalue, and if you change B a little bit, well, A and B may no longer have the same eigenvalues, but they'll have almost the same eigenvalues. In that sense, eigenvalues of a matrix depend continuously on the matrix. That's clear. Because when you change the matrix, where well, eigenvectors, directions might change slightly, eigenvalues might change slightly, but okay, only continuously. So, we know that star of n, so to speak, is true for pqn and qnp, if you like, yeah, in this approximation. So, for each of these approximating matrices here, in this safe region, we have the statement. And the statement is true here, it's 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 true here. And when it converge, it's true here. Because it's a continuous statement. As you take the limit, this is true. Also, and that's really QED, the end of the proof. I hope that you enjoy this kind of argument. Let's revise once again what we did. We wanted to prove that PQ and QP had the same eigenvalues. There was a very simple, easy case that we identified to begin with, and that's when Q was invertible. Then this identity 
straightforward, shows you the PQ and QP, uh, similar conjugate, they are matrices of the same linear transformation, so of course they have the same eigenvalue. But an objection was that maybe Q is not invertible. It's then that topology starts kicking in. In fact, topology started kicking in already when we adopted the attitude of looking at the simplest cases, most generic, most common, the majority of cases. We always begin by the generic case, and then worry about the degeneracies later. In the degenerate case, we realized that you can approximate the degenerate case by the generic cases. Or if you like, we can deform the degenerate case to generic cases. And since for each of the generic cases, the statement is true, and because the statement is a continuous statement, I can take this approximation, and in the limit, it's also true. That's the crux of the argument. OK? Good. I'd like to suggest then some problems. So those problems can be done as assignments. How shall we call them? Then? Because I don't want to call them problems. I might use the problem in some other context. Let's call them projects. Okay. So project number one that you might want to do is the investigation of the movie strip. When you have n twists, cut it along the D line, what happens? Project number two. is prove that for any, every, say, <coughs> square matrix, L, the determinant of the exponential of this matrix, I shall make comment, is equal to exponential of the trace of this matrix. Who among you has seen the exponential of a matrix? Exponential of a number, everyone has seen. Exponential of a matrix, have you seen? The simplest way to define it is a, as a power series. You take the exponential power series, and instead of the variable, you put the matrix there. And you can show, not too difficult, that this series converges, in other words, every element of the matrix, entry of the matrix converges, and that's the exponential of the matrix. And it turns out that that's also a square matrix, and if you take a determinant of that, it's the same as taking a trace of the matrix and taking the exponential. Interesting. Try to prove this by this kind of argument, topological approach by deformation. Well, it's easy, I'd like to give you a hint, when L is diagonal. And you notice that most matrices are diagonalizable. You might have learned, for example, the theory of Jordan canonical form, Jordan normal forms, that appears when the matrix is not diagonalizable. But this theory, beloved of instructors of linear algebra, though it may be, is kind of a perverse theory, because most matrices are diagonalizable. You have to be really unlucky for your random matrix to be non-diagonalizable. Okay. Another project, similar idea, is prove what is called the Cayley Hamilton theorem. Another classic theorem in linear algebra. And again, you note that the Cayley Hamilton theorem is basically trivial when the matrix you have is diagonal, but most matrices are diagonalizable. OK. So those are two projects. Oh, right, project among, so this is one single project. OK, so that's, is that clear? So one project is Mobius, and that's another project, but it has two parts, because they can be done by the same idea. And if you can think of, other situations, 
that are amenable, that can be solved by the same method. That's great. So, part infinity, think of other statements in linear algebra or matrix theory that can be proved in this case, in this sense, topologically by deformation method. That's a research problem. Okay. I'd like to, before we close this section, this example, make a comment about the fact that PQ and QP always have the same eigenvalues. A remark, this is one of those remarks where you don't have to worry about if you don't understand what I'm talking about. It will pass quickly, so don't worry. You have all seen what the trace of a matrix is, presumably. The usual way to define what the trace is is to take a square matrix and add all the diagonal terms. This plus, this plus, and that's the trace. But the much better way to think about the trace is to say that it's the sum of all the eigenvalues. That's a better way to think about it. Similarly, determinant. I don't know how you learned what the determinant was. One of the ways of thinking about the determinant is that it's the product of all the eigenvalues. That's another way to think about the determinant. So trace is the sum of the, all the eigenvalues. Yeah. So since that's the case, since trace is the sum of all the eigenvalues, the relation, so-called commutation relation that's so important in quantum mechanics. It says that PQ minus QP equals some multiple of the identity. It's in fact usually the H bar, the Planck constant times the identity, but you don't have to worry about the Planck constant. So PQ minus QP is proportional to the identity matrix. That's really central to quantum mechanics. Is impossible. It can never happen. Why? Take the trace on both sides. And we get trace of PQ minus trace of QP. But that's zero because they have the same trace. Yeah? Because these eigenvalues are the same. Zero equals something trace of the identity matrix is not zero. Something. Non zero. Yeah. And for example. Yeah. So this relationship can never happen. And yet, quantum mechanics uses this all the time. What's going on? Maybe quantum mechanics is wrong. It is not wrong. What it's saying is that, is that in order to do quantum mechanics, you need infinite matrices. So in finite dimensional space, this is impossible. You have to do infinite dimensional spaces. And for those of you who have learned about function analysis, linear operators, and so on, I'd like to point out that, in fact, that relationship is impossible even for bounded operators on Hilbert and so on, Banach spaces and so on. If the operator is bounded, that cannot happen. There is a separate proof. In finite dimensional linear operators, that's completely impossible because of what we have discussed. But even in infinite dimensional spaces, for bounded operators, it doesn't work. So quantum mechanics must, cannot avoid using unbounded operators. So all the theorems that we learn about spectral resolutions of um, bounded operators in Hilbert spaces and so on, that goes out of the window. We cannot use it in quantum mechanics. Amazing situation. OK. Good. I would like to take a break then.
we have been together for one hour approximately, for five minutes, and then we'll continue. Um, I might talk a little bit, and then we'll start working on yesterday's problems and then continue.